The iconography of the American frontier wouldn't be what it is today without the fearsome figures and various folk heroes both celebrated and reviled over the course of the last 150 years of the country's history. These iconic and infamous men and women range from belligerent bandits and the courageous lawmen that chased them down, to the cowboys and Native Americans that took their turns firing warning shots until the entire territory was rife with violence and sabotage, with a few peacekeepers and honorable heroes sprinkled in. One such figure was none other than the legendary showman and former soldier turned buffalo hunter, Buffalo Bill Cody himself. Once the son of a Canadian surveyor and staunch supporter of the American abolitionist movement, Buffalo Bill Cody transformed into one of the most discussed, complex, and undeniably popular figures of Old West lore. Regardless of his exploits and influence on American popular culture, Cody lived a life emblematic of so many ideas and themes, saturating the way we talk about the influence of the frontier lifestyle, both of the past and into the modern age. In order to gain a better understanding of how a scout for the U.S. Army became synonymous with the term Old West, we present to you a closer inspection into the tales and times of one of the most famous showmen in all of history. This is William Frederick Cody, colloquially known as Buffalo Bill, and the story of his life and the times traversing the Western frontier. William Cody, later recognized more commonly by his nickname and showman moniker, Buffalo Bill, first made his mark on the frontier on the 26th of February, 1840. He was born near the quaint little settlement called La Claire, Iowa, a recent European American establishment from just a decade or so prior. Part of this Anglo-Saxon community were Cody's parents, Isaac Cody and Marianne Laycock, an immigrant from Upper Canada and transplant from New Jersey, respectively. Marianne was an official descendant of a notable Pennsylvania Quaker named Josiah Bunting. However, she mostly shed her Quaker upbringing after starting a family with Isaac. She departed the East Coast as a young woman and relocated to Cincinnati. Her original dream was to become a teacher and found employment at a local school to instruct children right off the Ohio River. It was here Marianne met and married Isaac Cody a successful land surveyor and the future father of their eight children. The first three born were sisters Catherine and Julia Cody in 1835 and 1843, with their brother Sam Cody born in between in 1841. The future Buffalo Bill's turn arrived in 1846. Around his first birthday, the Cody family up and left Scott County, Iowa for Isaac's former stomping ground in Peel County, Ontario. In 1847, Cody was baptized at the Dixie Union Chapel, an establishment built and paid for by the Cody forefathers of yesteryear. The family would call Ontario home for another couple of years, seeing another one of their children, Eliza Cody, born in 1848. It didn't take long for their itinerant nature to take hold once again though, and by 1849, the Codys were back on the family farm in La Claire. Over the next few years, the Cody clan would deal with their fair share of ups and downs. The eldest son, Samuel, died in a riding accident in 1853, while another daughter, K.K. Cody, was born the same year. Despite the roller coaster the Cody family found themselves on, Isaac felt yet another move was in their best interests. If anything, another breath of fresh air would do them all good after the tragic loss of Sam, and the financial gain of resettling was too good an option to pass up. Thus, the Cody's LeClaire farmland was sold for around $2,000, and the family up and left for Fort Leavenworth of the Kansas Territory, where homesteaders attempted to take advantage of an expanding frontier. Isaac made his mark here by sourcing forage and wood for the nearby Kickapoo Native American tribes. With the land expansion came a melting pot of political opinion and tension-filled pockets of folks with an opinion that they were willing to die by. There was still the better half of a decade before the Civil War would reshape America, and in 1850s Kansas territory, the population was split down the middle regarding abolitionists 
and pro-slavery supporters. Cody's father, Isaac, was as anti-slavery as a white abolitionist could be in the mid-19th century. He wasn't the only one either, as activists were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the slavery sympathizers, making their voices be heard. Oftentimes, the tension would teeter on violence, and conflicts, both bloody and blaring, would break out all across America's heartland. Eventually, Isaac ensnared himself into such an entanglement. In 1854, he was summoned to speak at a local store called Rivley's. The popular trading post was normally a pro-slavery outfit, and sympathizers would use it to congregate over the question of slavery. While it was a hostile atmosphere for abolitionists such as Isaac, he wouldn't be scared into shy submission. Rather, the real estate investor made his stance on slavery loud and clear, arguing on behalf of anti-slavery long enough that he received death threats from an otherwise close-minded crowd. As a result, Isaac's tirade never reached its conclusion. After suggesting he wasn't in favor of extending slavery, a man from the crowd charged and stabbed Isaac with a bowie knife, delivering two blows to the chest. Luckily, the operator of the trading post, the man they called Rively, was quick to respond. He got treatment for Isaac fast enough to save his life, albeit leaving him with permanent injuries. The only thing worse than the physical damage suffered by Isaac was the psychological damage incurred by the entire Cody family. After the townsfolk of Leavenworth learned of the surveyor's politics, some of the strongest opposers were said to antagonize any and all members of the family, both in public and at home. Isaac was so anxious of an impending attack against his family, he'd spend most of his time traveling throughout the frontier, solely to save his family from any further harassment. The titular Cody would later write about a memory he carried with him as a young boy during these trying times. He recalled the moment when his father's location was revealed to a posse of slavery supporters, looking to punish Isaac for his ideals, planning to intercept him and kill him on his scheduled ride home. Bedridden with a nasty illness and barely scraping by the age of 10, Cody defied doctor's orders and rode a family's horse upwards of 30 miles to his father's rendezvous. There, he warned his father of the plot against his life by the early predecessor to Confederate bushwhackers. In the end though, Isaac Cody's clock was reaching its final tick anyway. In the winter of 1856 and into 1857, the patriarch made his final stance for the abolitionist movement. He embarked on a cross-country trek to Cleveland, Ohio, where around 30 families were waiting to make their own move to Kansas and increase the anti-slavery demographic. On his way back to Levensworth, however, Isaac fell sick with a respiratory illness that would eventually lead to his downfall. The illness, combined with complications of the stab wound and a worsening kidney condition, shot his already weakened immune system. He died in the spring of 57. Emphasizing the life of Cody's father and family during his childhood is vital to understanding the man and myth he would later come to be. His pre-adolescence was nomadic and flared by action. He was constantly on the move too, bearing witness to chaos and conflict and the wonder of the unknown. These sentiments could just as easily describe the elder Buffalo Bill, and describe him they would, all in due time. After the loss of Isaac, his family struggled to make ends meet. Cody knew he needed to step up in the aftermath and sought employment as an 11-year-old kid. He found work as a boy extra, a position on a freight carrier firm called Major & Russell, the early iteration of Russell Majors & Waddle of later fame. For the freighter outfit, Cody would ride his horse up and down the wagon train, relaying messages from the driver to the workman and vice versa. It was on the trails with Alexander Majors and William Russell that Cody was said to have met the legendary James Wild Bill Hickok, then a Jayhawker active around Kansas and the surrounding territories for Jim Lane's Free State Army. Hickok was about 10 years to Cody's senior, but took him under his wing when legend has it he saved the youngster from a bully sharing the trails up north. The two quickly fostered a friendship as Cody continued on his duties with the freighters. 
During one of these excursions with the wagon train, Cody also officially met U.S. Colonel Albert Sidney Johnston. It just so happened Majors and Russell were the contractors hired to haul supplies for Johnston's army, and Cody was the boy extra. Their meeting came at the onset of the infamous Utah War, a conflict waged between the Mormon settlers of the Utah Territory and soldiers of the U.S. government. At the time, word out of Salt Lake City centered on a rebellion that was thought to be brewing amongst the settlement's Mormon population. While the rumors proved to be nothing more than just that, gossip in the wind, Cody made such an impression on Colonel Johnston, he was made an official U.S. Army scout for the Utah campaign. At just 12 years old, Cody yearned for the thrill only the frontier could provide, dodging parties of hostile natives while constantly on the lookout for Mormon insurgents. As the Utah War died down and Johnston's army transferred throughout the Western territories, Cody heard of opportunities out on the Pacific coast. During this time, the notable plainsman also boasted about time spent working as a fur trapper, teamster, hotel manager, and as a 59er taking part in the Pikes Peak Gold Rush. The whispers of gold were strong elsewhere too, and with traces having been found from Fort Colville in northern Washington, and all the way south in California's Holcomb Valley, it all seemed destined for the kid soldier to high step it to the Golden State on a final quest for grandeur. And yet, Cody wouldn't quite make it to the California border, let alone the gold fields further west, as he had met an agent riding through the frontier for the recently established Pony Express. The Pony Express was the express mail service utilizing riders on horseback to deliver letters, parcels, and telegrams between California and Missouri. It was started by none other than Russell, Majors, and a third business partner, William B. Waddle. Considering he already knew two of the three horsemen, the opportunity was too good to pass up. Cody inquired with the agent regarding potential employment, and after his acceptance into the program, is said to have rode with the Pony Express henceforth, at least for a couple of years. Many of these claims depicting his frontier adventures and a diverse resume came straight from the mouth, or better yet, the written word of Buffalo Bill Cody himself. However, it should be noted that historians have struggled to confirm these exploits through records and documentation of the time period. While researchers agree there is little debate of Cody's claims he was a beaver trapper along the northern plains or a gold miner near the South Platte River, they have been unable to certify any evidence he served the Pony Express between 1860 and 1861, despite his connections to its founders. Scholars, without a way to independently confirm Cody's whereabouts in this time frame, place him amidst his aforementioned gigs at the gold fields and on stagecoach drives, becoming a skilled horseman while still finding time to complete his schoolwork and various studies. In the end, an urgent letter from home beckoned Cody back to Leavenworth, where his mother had fallen ill again. The teenage Buffalo Bill was needed by his family, and no matter how glorious further adventures on the frontier seemed, he knew his ultimate place was by Mary Ann's bedside. Around the same time, the Civil War was kicking off all across the southern United States, and Cody's devotion to his father's dying passion drove him to enlist with the Union Army. Cody waited out his mother's recovery before finding new employment with yet another freighter outfit, this time a supply caravan making runs to Fort Laramie in present-day Wyoming. Once he got his first taste of independence again, and with Marianne back to full strength, Cody couldn't help but continue circling a chance to assist the Union Army efforts. His foray against the Confederacy was only about to begin. While a teenage William Frederick Cody awaited his turn to soldier and scout for the Union Army, he wanted a way to impact his opposition by whatever means necessary, including a touch of violence. In what many have interpreted as both a conscious and subconscious drive to avenge his father's cold-blooded murder, or at least the attack that cultivated a premature demise, 
Cody set his sights on striking back against the pro-slavery movement. As such, he joined a local band of Kansas Jayhawkers, the same batch of anti-slavery insurgents who were hell-bent on making life miserable for the bushwhackers and their fellow sympathizers down on the Kansas-Missouri border. For a while, Cody and his Jayhawking cohort targeted lingering strands of the Missouri border ruffians. Border ruffians were composed of raiders and pro-slavery antagonists, focused on ensuring Kansas was admitted to the Union as a slave state as opposed to a free state. These gangs were most active between 1854 and 1858, during the incendiary period of frontier history called Bleeding Kansas. They specialized in voter fraud, but weren't shy from scaring off anti-slavery settlers and implementing intimidation tactics, such as raids, robbery, arson, and threats of violence, that often teetered on bloody conflict. By the time the Civil War was underway, many of the original border ruffians ran off to fight for the seceding South, or pillage free states as Confederate guerrillas. Yet, stragglers remained in the Sunflower State, and Cody and company would make their presence known by wrestling horses, burning property, and shooting anyone who tried to stop them. Later in life, Cody would lament his time as a Jayhawker, his guilt scratching away at his conscience. He'd admit as much too, when he was quoted as saying, I entered upon a dissolute and reckless life, to my shame be it said, and associated with gamblers, drunkards, and bad characters generally. By the fall of 1863, Cody's mother Marianne had fallen ill once more, and to the grief of her eldest living son, it would prove to be the final bout. She passed away in November, and Cody struggled to cope with the loss of his second parent. Unable to properly mourn his mother, Cody turned to the bottle to fill the pit both in his stomach and his heart. It would be distilled spirits and a bit of bad whiskey too that would catapult Cody into his next phase of life, when he reportedly went to bed drunk off the budge and awoke an enlisted man with Company H of the 7th Kansas Volunteer Cavalry. With Company H, Cody served as a private working as a teamster for both his company and the 7th Cavalry at large. They fought alongside the Union Army and took tours through Tennessee, Mississippi, Missouri, and of course, Kansas. It's assumed Cody took part in various battles and skirmishes up until the end of the war. Once the smoke cleared and fighting ceased in 1865, Cody was discharged and returned home. On his break from the battlefield, he married his longtime wife, Louisa Frederici, Louisa hailed from St. Louis and met Cody in her hometown during his trip to the Gateway City at the close of the Civil War. The wedding took place on March 6, 1866, near Arnold, Missouri, where the Frederici family farm sat amongst the plains. Cody had been spending most of his time driving horses and fulfilling scouting contracts, but felt enamored by the independent young woman and knew settling down with the family was in order. The issue was, settling down simply wasn't in the DNA of William Frederick Cody. He was a journeyman in his heart, soul, and spirit, and he'd be damned if he was forced to sit around as the hotel keeper in Salt Creek Valley, Kansas, until the end of time. After escaping the homestead, Cody left his newly minted family for another set of adventures on the frontier. By the end of 1866, he was traversing America's heartland, for the new opportunities when he ran into an old friend and mentor, Wild Bill Hickok in Junction City, Kansas. There, Hickok revealed he had been working as a scout at Fort Ellsworth and could secure Cody a similar position at the same outpost. Cody accepted the offer and soon enlisted as a scout for the U.S. Army. One of his first assignments was scouting for Captain George Augustus Arm, famous for his feats in the Battle of the Saline River. Before long, though, Cody would break through in his duties to the United States government when he was assigned to guide and horse drive for Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer and the 7th Cavalry Regiment of the U.S. Army, nicknamed the Jerry Owen. Over the next few months or so, Cody would embark on scouting missions for the 7th, eventually running into railroad contractor William Rose in 1867. 
Rose was hoping to build a town where a railroad crossing connecting Big Creek to the recently relocated Fort Hayes was under construction via the Kansas Pacific Railway. The town was thought to provide a hub for buffalo hunters, soldiers, and travelers traversing central Kansas, and Cody thought it would be the perfect investment into frontier real estate. While the town of Rome in Ellis County, Kansas didn't last long, the newfound relationship between Cody and the eponymous railroad contractor proved vital to the lasting legacy of Buffalo Bill. Once the actual railway itself was finished in both Rome and Hayes City, Cody was asked by his contacts at the Union Pacific Eastern Division, the parent company of its Kansas Pacific branch, to be hired on as a contractor to hunt buffalo for the railway workers' food supply. The contract came down from the Goddard brothers, who were responsible for feeding every single one of the Kansas Pacific's employees. Cody was offered $500 a month for the gig, upwards of $11,000 in today's money when adjusted for inflation. The top dollar equated to the incredibly dangerous nature of wide-scale bison hunting, but if anyone was mustered for the job, it was William Cody. He submitted a leave of absence request with the U.S. Army, and upon their approval, he set out for the Great Plains. Over the next year and a half, Cody displayed an innate ability to hunt American buffalo seemingly with ease. Out in the tall grass wilderness, he could always be found with two trusted components to his hunts, his horse and his gun. Cody's horse was named Brigham, nicknamed after the founder of Salt Lake City and second major leader of the Mormon pioneers, Brigham Young. His Springfield Trapdoor's famous moniker, the Lucretia Borgia, came from the same named Italian noblewoman of Roman lore. Both the mount and the hunting rifle were integral to Cody's success on the range. With Brigham and the Borgia by his side, Cody went on to hunt over an estimated 4,000 American buffalo between October 1867 and May 1868, with most accounts placing the total number at 4,280, per Cody's own autobiography. The legend goes that William Cody once successfully hunted 48 bison in just a 30-minute time frame, a feat so unimaginable some have questioned its authenticity as fact. These awe-striking accomplishments also gave birth to Cody's own epithet. After only a few short weeks in the hunting fields, railway workers by the dozens bestowed the frontiersman with the name Buffalo Bill, as he never failed to show without a cart filled to the brim with game meat. The sight of one Buffalo Bill riding into an end of railway camp, where hungry laborers were the only thing standing between the track and expansive wilderness, often encouraged the men to sing a song in his honor. The boisterous bunch relieved at the presence of food and the man responsible for it. The most famous of these little ditties went along like this. Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill, never missed and never will, always aims and shoots to kill, and the company pays his Buffalo Bill. Oftentimes, during his treks through the flat plains of Kansas, Cody and a small team of fellow butchers and drivers would come across hostile bands of Native Americans. He would later write that these conflicts were best served immediately after a successful hunt, when their wagons were chock full of buffalo hams. As soon as a scout or driver would spot an oncoming raiding party, the stockade would see the mules unhitched from their wagons and tied to the wheels instead. Then, Cody and company would toss out the buffalo hams to form cover from the hostiles' gunfire or other ammunition. While hiding behind the meaty makeshift breastworks, Cody would launch a smoke signal or two high into the clouds, alerting nearby soldiers or militiamen of the natives' advance. The esteemed hunter himself would write that he and his stockade could fend off anywhere from 40 to 60 attacking men at a time, and throughout his entire buffalo campaign, Cody only lost five men to indigenous raids, two butchers, and three drivers, a notable success story considering the other losses felt by the railway companies. However, by the summer of 1868, the increasing conflicts by marauding Cheyenne warriors were too much for Cody and the general laborers of the Kansas Pacific Railway. These patterns, combined with inclement weather and torrential thunderstorms, made it too dangerous to continue operations as usual. 
their parent company, the Union Pacific, placed a temporary hold on all construction efforts after the last track was laid in Sheridan, Kansas, as they were forced to stand by while Native American relations were under scrutiny. As a result, Cody's contract through the Goddard brothers expired, but he wasn't without employment for much more than a month. Considering his prior service with Cody's knowledge of the plain, experience fighting the smaller pockets of hostile Cheyennes, he was quickly hired as a scout by the U.S. Army once again. With a new objective in hand, Cody took the scouting position as seriously as he had taken any contract over the last few years. In fact, it was his courage and steel-hearted diligence displayed on his next major assignment that catapulted the soldier into his next phase of his career. Nearing the end of 1868, General Philip Sheridan of the U.S. Army was on the lookout for scouts knowledgeable of Native Americans on the plains and their nomadic tendencies. Hayes City was filled with such men, called Indian Scouts at the time, all lingering around the Kansas Railroad town waiting for an assignment. William Cody was amongst these scouts, but took no part in loafing around until the danger passed. Employed under the Quartermaster's Department and stationed at Fort Larned, Cody was dispatched to Fort Hayes as a courier, a vital message for his superiors in tow. Cody wasted no time and rode the 65 miles through harsh conditions, a trail rife with hostiles and the imminent threat of an ambush. Eventually, he made it to the railway outpost with intelligence for General Sheridan, intelligence detailing the decampment and movement of Cheyenne warriors from the Fort Larned region. General Sheridan felt it was in the Army's best interests to spread the word and prepare the surrounding forts to safeguard against any impending offensive. After an attempt to pour little fruit to persuade other timid scouts to make the trip southwest to Fort Dodge, he had only one option left, ask Cody to take on the mission himself. Despite having just returned from his first arduous trek from Fort Lauren to Fort Hayes, Cody didn't think twice and took on the assignment, as both he and Sheridan knew none of the other men would take on such a gamble. From Fort Hayes, Cody set out on his next 95 mile journey. He brought with him extra arms for protection, as the trail to Fort Dodge was littered with clandestine grave markers, where scouts before him weren't so lucky wading through enemy territory. When he arrived at Coon Creek, Cody rested in traded mounts with a troop of cavalry posted by the brook. Finally, he made contact with the commanders at Fort Dodge, and they sent the journeyman scout all the way back to Fort Larned where his courier duties began. Over the last leg of the 350-mile trek, Cody returned to Fort Hayes with additional news from General Hazen that the Cheyenne villages were already repositioned just south of the Arkansas River. When Sheridan and company made contact with the transplanted indigenous villages, they found it was populated by women, children, and elders, and the warrior factions had continued north of Arkansas to carry out additional raids. With the Cheyenne's footprint tracked so quickly, Cody's courageous journey across hundreds of miles of shadowy plains, all under 60 hours, was deemed an outstanding success. As a reward, Cody was kept in service by General Sheridan and granted Chief of Scouts for the incoming 5th Cavalry Regiment. For full four years, William Cody led scouting campaigns and waged in conflict during the Plains Wars, the Greater American Frontier Wars. He spent much of the first few years with the 5th Cavalry before sharing the same duties as Chief of Scouts with the 3rd Cavalry. His first stretch as scout chief was packed with action. Between October of 68 and October of 69, Cody engaged in at least nine known fights across seven expeditions against hostile bands of Native Americans. It was more real rugged combat than some of the most decorated soldiers experienced in 10 years of service, let alone a single calendar. In the final months of 1871 and into January of 1872, Cody was honored with a request to accompany Grand Duke Alexei Alexandrovich on a four-month hunting expedition traversing the western frontier. He acted as the Royal Russian scout and guide, appeasing both his military leadership and the general public transfixed on such a headline-stealing affair. 
The latter bookend to Cody's illustrious scouting career came in April of 1872. At the southern fork of the Loop River in central Nebraska, a small army squad led by the frontiersmen stopped a recent band of insurgent Native Americans, plundering local settlements. They engaged in a running battle, and Cody's leadership was too much for the raiders to overcome, and the chief of the scouts walked away victorious. This accomplishment, and the countless others that preceded it, were enough to earn William Cody the Medal of Honor, awarded to the decorated scout and fearless frontiersman on May 22, 1872. Captain Charles Meinhold, one of the superiors involved with the proceedings, wrote in a letter of commendation, stating, Mr. William Cody's reputation for bravery and skill as a guide is so well established that I need not say anything else, but that he acted in his usual manner. In other words, Buffalo Bill needs no introduction. The resume speaks for itself. After the Medal of Honor found its way onto Cody's mantelpiece, and his service as a scout for the United States military reached a ceremonial end, life was truly just beginning. While many folks wondered what the great William Cody might do upon retirement, the frontiersman wasn't as directionless. He knew of his own fame and the potential fortune that could come with it. The next step in Cody's career all came down to a chance encounter in 1869 with a mostly anonymous fellow named Ned Buntline. Buntline, as it would turn out, would spark the fire that burned right into the heart of the legacy of Buffalo Bill Cody. By the late 1860s, and well after the excitement of the Civil War vanished like desert dust, freelance writer and journalist Edward Judson Sr., better known by his pen name, Ned Buntline, was struggling to make a name for himself in the wide world of publishing. As a result, he spent much of the decade's latter half crossing the frontier in search of a worthy story. He had a penchant for dime novels and figured the fantasy inspired by frontiersmen posed as the best fodder for future work. To kickstart his odyssey in the Old West, Buntline took part and the growing temperance movement in the United States. Despite secretly, or maybe not so secretly, binge drinking on his own accord, the sporadic writer went homestead to homestead, knocking on doors and preaching about the immorality of alcohol consumption. It was through a temperance lecture tour through Nebraska that Buntline caught wind of Wild Bill Hickok's presence at nearby Fort McPherson. Having just read all about Hickok's adventures on the frontier, he was inspired to write his next dime novel on the legendary folk hero. That is, if he could secure an interview. It wasn't much time before Buntline was handed down quite the harsh rejection. At a saloon in Fort McPherson, Buntline tracked down Hickok and proudly exclaimed, There's my man. I want you. Without offering as much as a gentleman's introduction. Of course, Hickok was a seasoned frontiersman at this point, and had felt his fair share of sneak attacks peppered throughout his trials. With Buntline's brash entrance, Hickok's fight or flight chose fight, and he pointed his pistol directly at the rider's heart. 24 hours to skip town is all Hickok gave him, and Buntline happily obliged. And yet, Buntline wasn't so ready to give up his prized master plan. Thinking his best shot at telling the story of Wild Bill Hickok was arranging interviews with his cohorts, his next quest took him across the Cornhusker State to where William Cody and his cohort from the 5th Cavalry were returning from battle with Cheyenne warriors. Cody, larger in life and more colorful than Buntline could have ever imagined, was happy to host the rider along with his crew and share a slew of stories, as long as he was willing to listen. Buntline was so captivated by the frontiersman tales, he decided to bypass his original focus on Hickok and create an entire catalog of articles, novels, and various publications about Buffalo Bill Cody instead. At first, Cody's Life and Times were published as articles in the New York Weekly, a story newspaper conflated with imaginative and mostly fictional retellings of his achievements. These efforts eventually evolved into a fully-fledged novel 
called Buffalo Bill, King of the Bordermen. King of the Bordermen was released in a series of serialized articles plastered on the front page of the New York Weekly and started circulating the Big Apple and beyond by December of 69. Budline's novel was a smashing hit and he continued writing about Cody as he completed his scouting tours with the 5th and 3rd Cavalry through the early 1870s. Readers couldn't get enough of the folklore and tall tales depicting the heroism and unbridled thrills the Old West had to offer. Up until that point, United States citizens east of the Mississippi hadn't had the exposure to frontier shenanigans through the lens of popular culture. There was no mythos or larger mythmaking banking on the mysterious nature of westward expansion. However, with an increasing demand for Buntline's biographies and exaggerating memoirs of William Cody, the appetite for more Old West fairy tales was only growing. And who else better to provide such follies and fantasies than the titular titan of the frontier himself? Thus, Cody wrapped up his career as a guide and immediately jumped into a new life as presenter of all things Wild West, a phrase not yet coined, but soon to be popularized in a way neither he nor Buntline could possibly have imagined. In March of 72, around the time Cody's military service was coming to an end, Ned Buntline published a series of new dime novels via the Weekly. These included Buffalo Bill's Best Shot, or The Heart of Spotted Tail, and Buffalo Bill's Last Victory, or Devi, the Lodge Queen, later in July. Alongside these stories, Buntline also wrote a series of letters he'd send in mass to Fort McPherson, where Cody was still hanging around. The frontiersman was amused by his growing popularity and the undying insistence from Buntline that he should come to Chicago and perform his stories on the stage. Buntline had drafted a series of plays and performances based on the highly successful Buffalo Bill dime novels, and was adamant that their adaptation for the stage would surely reap the rewards of stardom and a handsome profit to boot. Already with a taste of celebrity and acknowledgement that his days dangling in the face of danger were better suited for the past rather than the present, Cody obliged. Before he bought a one-way ticket to the Windy City, however, he made it his mission not to go alone, convincing his friend and fellow frontier scout, John Texas Jack Omohundro, to tag along for the ride. On December 12, 1872, the dynamic duo met up with a starstruck writer in Chicago, Illinois. Less than a week away from the planned production of Buffalo Bill's Adventures, Bunline subtly yet surely let it slip he didn't yet have a script written, much to the horror of Cody and Texas Jack. Buntline assured him both men they need not worry. He simply needed more time for the inspiration to hit him. The dime novelist bunkered down in his hotel room while the frontiersmen enjoyed the festivities of the Midwest metropolis, mustering enough creativity to craft the production called Scouts of the Prairie, all under four hours. With a script in tow, Buntline spent the following days corralling talent for the makeshift extravaganza. He found amateur actors and actresses to play the roles of anonymous Native Americans, unaffected by their lack of professionalism. To play the part of the leading indigenous heroine, Buntline convinced Giuseppina Morlacchi, a well-known Italian ballerina and dancer who was familiar with the stage. Posters were plastered around the sprawling city enough word of mouth channeled through interested homes and businesses, and by opening night, Nixon's amphitheater was packed with around 2,500 spectators. Those two and a half thousand attendees bore witness to the genesis of the Western. No matter the forgotten dialogue by first-time thespian William Cody, no matter the bumbling background actors, no matter the complete lack of a through-line narrative, the folks who watched were enthralled beyond their wildest imaginations. Critics notoriously hated the production, if they were brave enough to even call it as such. One theater critic for the Chicago Tribune went as far as to ask why Buntline needed four hours to write the script. Based on his viewing, it appeared Scouts on the Prairie was much more than a juvenile improvisation. Cody was, above all, considered a diffident schoolboy by the professionals, but no one loved the stardom and pizzazz offered by the successive scouts more than him. Audiences raved about the handsome headlighting men 
and incomparable dancing abilities of their leading lady, Morlaki. The action was repulsive yet unending, and grabbed the attention of the populace without a means to let go. Still, critics attempted to thwart any semblance of a future for Cody, Buntline, and company. One Tribune contributor was quoted as saying, Such a combination of incongruous drama, execrable acting, renowned performers, mixed audience, and tolerable stench, scalping blood and thunder is not likely to be vouchsafed to a city a second time, even Chicago. Nevertheless, the colorful characters of Chicago welcomed the showman back tenfold. From the Midwest to the Atlantic coast, the ragtag troop of new school thespians took scouts of the prairie wherever they pleased. Crowds everywhere were clamoring for their first taste of the Western. By the summer of 1873, the Eastern tour of Buffalo Bill reached its end, and Cody and Buntline parted ways for the time being. The frontiersman wasn't finished as a showman, rather, only just beginning. His dreams became bigger than he originally fathomed, and he wanted control over his very own show. To kick off his new venture, Cody hired the more seasoned playwright and Fred G. Mater for assistance on the plot of the next production. The frontiersman wanted a greater scope for him and Texas Jack to scout the plains, so to speak. Mater put pen to paper and fleshed out the story to the show of the same name. On September 8th of 73, Williamsport, Pennsylvania saw the first live production of a revamped Scouts. Surprising the Billtown spectators was none other than Wild Bill Hickok, Cody's closest confidant from his days as a Jayhawker, Scout, and now Showman. Some wondered if Buntline's lack of presence was the deal breaker for Hickok's presence, but we'll never know the truth. The fact of the matter, however, was that the theater life was not the life for Hickok. He was often uncomfortable during performances and made his feelings known to the rest of the troupe of his disdain for acting. Both critics and the general audience alike witnessed the old gunslinger hide behind the stage dressing, and one legend goes he shot out a spotlight when it was pointed towards him unexpectedly. Eventually, the grumblings turned into conflict. Hickok unleashed his anger towards Cody, engaging in a heated argument before departing for good and putting their longtime friendship in jeopardy. The frontier showman could only shrug it off, though, and didn't let the short fused feud distract him. The show must go on, after all. Go on is exactly what the show did, taking the troupe all across the country for a dozen years. Some performances included a rendition of the famous Scouts of the Prairie, while other shows utilized a combination of the other frontier dramas Cody was concocting with his team of playwrights and assembled actors. One such performance was the dramatic retelling of the Battle of Warbonnet Creek and Cody's unexpected role he played in the conflict. In April of 1876, Cody received a telegram with news of his son, Kit Carson Cody's recent bout of scarlet fever. The frontiersman wasted no time in bidding Texas Jack and company adieu before riding like lightning to the family's residence in Rochester, New York. While Cody made it in time to see his son alive for the final time, Kit's condition had worsened and he died while his father held him soon thereafter. It was an unconsciously difficult loss for the frontiersman turned showman. He had already sacrificed a life spent with his wife and children, and to lose his son so suddenly and at such a young age, he needed a way to grieve. Like most hardened men of the frontier, grief often led to rage and what more applicable activity to unleash a boiling wrath than war. He had been receiving telegrams and letters tenfold from his old contacts in the U.S. Army. General Sheridan, along with Captain Eugene Carr of Pea Ridge fame, were insisting Cody return for what was expected to be the last major war of the American-Indian conflict. Cody didn't need much persuasion after the loss of Kit, and rejoined the 5th Cavalry commanded by Colonel Merritt's troops in Wyoming territory. Texas Jack and the rest of his showmen were temporarily disbanded in Wilmington, Delaware. In Wyoming, Cody and the rest of the 5th Cavalry were requested north of Goose Creek, where General George Crook was dealing with the fallout from the Battle of the Rosebud and the losses incurred by George Custer at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Colonel Merritt, however, had other intentions. 
as the news of the Native American reinforcements ascending north to join Sitting Bull in Montana reached the 5th Cavalry. Thus, Merritt, Cody, and company went north to the Powder River Trail instead in attempts to intercept the incoming Cheyenne warriors. In an astounding feat, the 5th Cavalry made it to Warbonnet Creek in northwestern Nebraska in just 31 hours, trekking through 85 miles of wilderness to reach their destination. Cody rode up front, hoping to lead the troops alongside Merritt. He felt back at home, scouting the plains with danger lurking behind every shadow, and the men were happy to have him there. On July 17, 1876, Cody was given a scouting mission to track down Little Wolf's encampment and his band of Cheyenne warriors. Dressed in his finest silk shirt borrowed from his stage costumes, Cody discovered a nearby Cheyenne village. When he circled back to his own post, he learned the rest of the 5th had detected Cheyenne scouts on the perimeter and were in position to launch a defensive if needed. From up above on the hillsides overlooking Warbonnet Creek, Merritt, Cody, and Captain Carr saw the contingent of Cheyenne scouts huddled together. At first, they anticipated an attack, before realizing the hostiles had spotted a supply wagon train in the distance, making its way towards the 5th's position. Unwilling to waste any precious time, Cody asked Merritt for permission to lead his own team of scouts down to the creek to fend off the Cheyenne party already on their way to intercept the supply train. Merritt waved the green flag, and the fight was on. Cody and his scouts charged relentlessly at the Cheyenne warriors, who were too transfixed on the supply wagons to brace themselves for the fifth surprise offensive. With a few volleys of the troops' rifles, the Cheyenne dispersed across the valley. Cody himself rode across Warbonnet Creek to search for stragglers, and ran into a lone Cheyenne warrior they called Yellowhair. His name originated not because of his own, but rather for the blonde-haired scalp he kept fastened to his belt. The frontiersman didn't hesitate to fire a shot, and landed a round right into the leg of Yellowhair. The warrior fell from his horse just as Cody stumbled off of his. Now face to face, with all four feet planted on solid ground, both men took turns firing at one another. Yellowhair missed his mark, but the frontiersman had no such misfortune. After the warrior fell to the earth, Cody scalped the one they called Yellowhair and aided the rest of the fifth in their push of the Cheyenne camp all the way to the Red Cloud Agency. Here, they assimilated with the rest of the indigenous population to the region, and Cody and company pushed forward. Over the next month or so, the 5th Cavalry would press further north into the Great Plains, chasing down the legendary Lakota war chief Sitting Bull and his band of warriors. Despite working under a cohort of 2,000 men, Cody and his 20 under scouts were unable to track down the dispersing warriors, and the rest of the columns couldn't give chase. By August, Cody had admitted to himself the flare of the American Indian Wars was being slowly extinguished and with uncertainty swirling around his position as chief of scouts, he resigned to return to life as a showman, albeit armed with a brand new story shimmering with his iconic blood and thunder. The Battle of Warbonnet Creek soon became better remembered as the monstrous five-act stage play called The Red Right Hand, or Buffalo Bill's first scalp for Custer. This time, Cody's troop featured the likes of Captain Jack Crawford, a fellow scout and poet who befriended the frontiersmen during the Great Sioux War. The play was nonsensical, but ripe with the action that made Buffalo Bill a household name. Critics couldn't make heads or tails of it, but the tickets sold like hotcakes, the Western now back into full swing. Folks flocked from four counties over, no matter where the showmen went, everyone desperate to catch a glimpse of yellow hair scalp. You see, Cody didn't just return with another tale born of the frontier wars. Rather, he came back with a token of his decision, exploiting the casualty of his enemy for the sake of show business. In a way, it was emblematic of what Buffalo Bill symbolized as a whole, the Western's blur between fiction and reality, and its impact on society's hunger to relive its climactic adventures, however fantastical and however horrific. And yet, the man known internationally as Buffalo Bill was only getting started, 
about to transform pop culture at large and become the most famous man in the world when he introduced the legendary presentation, Buffalo Bill's Wild West. In 1883, William Cody wanted to go beyond the razzle-dazzle of Scouts on the Prairie and breathe life into the Western genre. His depictions of frontier adventures had already transformed into a behemoth of popular culture, and he knew deep down audiences would eventually grow as well. And with growth came a need for innovation. Thus, on Independence Day, Cody held a circus-like production at his ranch in North Platte, Nebraska a production likened to the predecessor of the rodeo. The term rodeo wasn't quite in circulation when describing these cowboy contests or stampedes. Instead, Cody's show was considered a flashier frontier days, filled with competition, live animals, reenactments, and vaudevillian elements inspired from his stage plays. For Cody and company, the 4th of July showcase was yet another smashing success and the scout turned showman immediately made plans for Buffalo Bill's Wild West to tour the world on an annual basis, with no end date in sight. Over the next few years or so, the scope and scale of the Wild West extravaganza ballooned with new sets and a colorful cast of characters. The motifs fused into the production were reenactments of Cody's alleged rides with the Pony Express, raids and ambushes beset by hostile Native Americans, and stagecoach stick-ups at the hands of amateur outlaws. Some accounts of Buffalo Bill's masterpiece allude to a prized performance near the end of every show, in which Cody and his ragtag team of actors would recreate the infamous battle of the Little Bighorn, colloquially considered as Custer's Last Stand. Certain scholars ascribe these performances as a product of myth-making. However, spectators were said to have seen Cody act as his former general, George Custer. While historians have yet to be convinced, the legend remains seen by many. Unlike the tall folk tales of the legends, Cody's corral of top American talents is undisputed fact. In 1885, two of his most famous real-life characters joined the Wild West troupe. None other than the awe-striking sharpshooter Annie Oakley and the highly respected Lakota war chief Sitting Bull. Oakley was often paired with her husband, Frank Butler, as a rambunctious couple of sharpshooters, featured in competitions and reenactments of modern-day rodeo events. A year into Oakley's tenure with the production, she formed a rivalry with another female marksman, this time with the championed California huntress and trick shooter, Lillian Smith. Smith was brought on around the same time as Gabriel Dumont, a Canadian buffalo hunter and leader of the Métis peoples. This perfect aim pair, combined with Oakley and Butler, were some of the most crowd-pleasing spectacles Buffalo Bill's Wild West had to offer. In terms of Sitting Bull's participation, the great Lakota warrior was granted the opportunity to take time away from his reservation in the Dakota Territory and take part in the life as experienced by the white man. For around $50 a week, he was instructed to ride around whatever arena Buffalo Bill had arranged for the day's show. He would make one lap on horseback before selling autographed photos to anyone who was willing to pay. One story goes that prior to a Wild West show commemorating the completion of the Northern Pacific Railway, Sitting Bull cursed the entire audience, one that included President Ulysses Grant in his native Lakota tongue. Another large chunk of reports painted Sitting Bull as having enormous pity for many of those folks struggling on the frontier. They said he was often sympathetic to the homeless and those living on the streets of U.S. cities that he would tour. Much of the money that he made from shows and from photograph sales went to the starved and less fortunate, whom he could not turn away from. All in all, it depressed Sitting Bull to his core, and after just a four-month trial with Buffalo Bill show, he returned to the Standing Rock Reservation, unable to face more of the same hardships suffered by others behind the scenes of the Wild West tour. Even though it was a short stint in show business, the inclusion of Sitting Bull and 20 members of his Lakota tribe did add a level of authenticity to the production at large. Gone were the days of Italian immigrants playing Native Americans, 
and the ability to provide indigenous performers with real wages was at the time unheard of for most of the entertainment industry. While audiences were disappointed to see the lost regalia of ornate costumes and unique perspectives of culture offered by Sitting Bull and Company, Buffalo Bill's Wild West wasn't afraid to experiment. In 1886, they added various components that would later become staples to Cody's masterpiece. One such addition was the inclusion of an official Wild West band, led by Cody's theatrical manager, Nate Salisbury, and their recently partnered performer, Evelyn Booth. Booth was an English big game hunter who heralded from the Booth aristocracy. The trio appointed William Sweeney, a background cornet player who had been touring with Cody since 1883, as director of the newly formed Buffalo Bill's Cowboy Band. Sweeney often composed brand new music for his fellow musicians and added a dramatic, crowd-pleasing fare through unique accompaniments. The other major addition to the Wild West extravaganza was the development of a proper finale. Cody wanted an ending that would create a lasting impression on his spectators, something he'd be proud of as it enthused critics and filled newspaper publications with free advertising. As a result, Cody concocted a final reenactment following the events of a hostile raid on a frontier homestead. He had his Native American actors ambush a small cabin, while a warning call was sent out to the thespian posse of cowboys and gunslingers. Led by none other than Buffalo Bill Cody himself, the vigilantes would ride in on horses and defend the homestead from its indigenous threat. As the natives ran off, Cody and company would cheer and jeer and claim victory much to the delight of the crowd. The standing ovations and calls for an encore thrilled the great showman so much so, it was featured in over 66% of productions between 1886 and 1907, despite its ornate and expensive format. Of William Cody's finest accomplishments across all his legendary career, none might be bigger than his historical performance of Buffalo Bill's Wild West during Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee at an event called London's American Exhibition. Cody wrangled his finest performers, stagehands, costume designers, and an entire corral of critters to join him on his quest beyond the Atlantic. According to the Smithsonian, this included approximately 83 saloon passengers, 38 steerage passengers, 97 Indians, 180 horses, 18 buffalo, 10 elk, 5 Texan steers, 4 donkeys, and two deer. Not even Noah's Ark could compete with such a fantastic voyage, at least in the eyes of America's greatest showman. He was validated soon thereafter too, when the Prince of Wales and the imminent King Edward VII met with Cody and Prime Minister William Gladstone before the Jubilee. It's said Edward VII was so enamored by Annie Oakley, Cody and his company, he personally implored the Queen to attend their spectacle and witness the magic with her very own eyes. In the end, the celebration was attended by Her Highness in the flesh, and the show was so successful across the pond, it went on to tour for an additional five months at venues in Birmingham and Manchester. Cody's worldly presence would only continue to spread as the 1880s came to a close, with a successful tour through Europe starting in 89 and bleeding into 1890. This included a legendary showing with Pope Leo XIII, in which Cody challenged nine Italian cowboys called Buteri to a skills competition. The nine Buteri in question absolutely dominated the American cowboys and became focal points in Italian lore soon thereafter. In 1892, Buffalo Bill's Wild West returned to the States having changed global popular culture both home and now abroad. It wouldn't be his last tour through Europe either, as a second rendition of the production returned to the continent from 1902 to 1906. Before the grand European finale, however, Cody continued his dominance over the United States entertainment landscape. An exhibition put on at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893 catapulted the showman from Wild West celebrity to purely an American celebrity. In the following year, Cody received a chance to test the waters of motion pictures in one of its earliest forms. Edison Studios, a film organization founded by none other than Thomas Edison himself, 
wanted to capitalize on Buffalo Bill's stardom as they attempted to get the cinematic arts off the ground and running. In 1894, a 60-second black and white silent film simply titled Buffalo Bill was produced by the studio. It featured William Cody displaying his sharpshooting skills with a rifle, stitched together with intertitles. Unfortunately for film history and the legacy of its eponymous lead, Buffalo Bill was lost to time, but fueled Cody's motion picture career as it evolved into the 20th century. Having conquered countless artistic mediums, traveled the earth, and captured the hearts of millions of people from both small towns and big cities alike, it's generally agreed that in 1900, William Frederick Cody was the most famous person alive, a celebrity of proportions no man or woman had ever seen before. Like the peak of any prodigy or performer, a decline wasn't too far in front of the man they called Buffalo Bill. It all started in October of 1901, right outside of Lexington, North Carolina. An engineer for the freighter company made a judgment error when Buffalo Bill's train car hadn't finished passing the junction. The showman's train consisted of three units, but the engineer figured it was only one. Thus, before the show car from Charlotte heading towards Danville, Virginia, could fully cross, another freight train collided with Buffalo Bill's prized assets, killing animals and injuring performers. Of these casualties were two of Cody's favorite horses, namely Old Pap and Old Eagle. Over 100 other mounts were killed in the crash, as well as an undetermined number of various critters. Annie Oakley was the biggest name to suffer critical injuries. She was dealt crushing blows to her lower half, and upon receiving medical attention, was told she would never walk again. Nothing could stop old Oakley from overachieving though, and she miraculously recovered to the point where she could resume life as it once was. A few others, they weren't so lucky. While there is no historical documentation to support this, one account states that three Native Americans, a part of Cody's troop, perished from their injuries sustained at the crash site. It would not be surprising if the death count was greater than reported on that tragic day of October 29th. After the train mishap, Buffalo Bill's Wild West took an extended hiatus that is often attributed to its gradual diminishing. While the American frontier's luster was already wearing thin by the beginning of the 20th century, a lack of Cody's presence in the theatrical circuit didn't help matters. Eventually, the production was able to recover, but it was never the well-oiled machine it had been for the 30 years prior. Cody poured much of his fortune into the Wild West well to keep it afloat, a cycle that repeated itself various times until most of the millions brought in by the showman saw no return on investment. In 1908, Cody tried his hand at a partnership with fellow frontier showman Gordon Pawnee Bill Lilly, and another four years later, tried his hand at feature filmmaking. Neither avenue led to the riches and rewards of yesteryear though, and America quickly found fascination elsewhere. Two bills, as Cody and Lilly called it, ran for five years before it went bankrupt in Denver, Colorado in 1913. The heyday of Buffalo Bill's Wild West was coming to a close. Even as William Cody faded from the spotlight, his impact on American history and the frontier at large did not lessen. Nor did his propensity for controversy a remarkable streak of controlling the headlines and news publications across the country. One of Cody's biggest dreams centered on the idea of founding a settlement somewhere in the Western frontier. He wanted such a place to form an emblem of the American West, where Old West traditions and the unifying sense of Americana were front and center. Such a project started as fascination with the Northwest Wyoming Territory, a Rocky Mountain region north of the High Plains. Cody passed through sometime in the 1870s, and something immediately clicked with a frontiersman whose imagination held no bounds. To him, Northwest Wyoming was the perfect place to attract settlers. It offered fertile farming land with top-notch soil, as well as endless game for year-round hunting seasons. Best of all, 
it was in close proximity to Yellowstone National Park, sporting vistas and beautiful scenery in and of itself. Thus, in 1896, Cody embarked back to the valley and settled the eponymous town of Cody, Wyoming. The year prior, the T.E. Ranch headquarters had been established 35 miles south of town, and gave the showman turned land developer a perch from which he could watch his Old West town thrive for years to come. Not long into the tenure of Cody, Wyoming, Buffalo Bill envisioned the potential of tourism on the streets he named after the men who helped him reach his recent successes. As a result, he incorporated the settlement in 1901, and in the next five years, constructed world-renowned hotels that would soon become part of the boom. The Irma Hotel, named after Irma Cody herself, was one such structure, followed by the Wapiti Inn and the legendary Pahaska Teepee in 1905. The Burlington Railway Line supplied the waves of tourists filling reservation books, and when they couldn't find vacancy downtown, they'd catch a ride down to TE headquarters, where Cody built a guest ranch with profits from the Wild West show. For years, the showman impressed his guests at home as well as he did on the road, hosting characters from both the United States and abroad. His premier services include guided hunting expeditions, horse rides through the country, and plenty of Rocky Mountain camping. The only thing missing in the eyes of William Cody was proper irrigation in the fields surrounding his settlement, as well as additional power sources in a state being depleted of its natural gases and coal by both private corporations and the U.S. government. To combat these losses and increase the fertility of the Bighorn Basin in northern Wyoming, Cody and a few of his right-hand men purchased irrigation rights to water over 150,000 acres of land, utilizing the Shoshone River. In need of a reservoir on top of a canal system, Cody and company worked tirelessly to acquire the funding needed for such a project, but struggled without governmental oversight. Of course, it wasn't in Buffalo Bill Cody's DNA to fail at such a level, and in 1903, he joined the Wyoming Board of Land Commissioners with plans to lobby the federal government for support. His pleas were answered later that year, when the Bureau of Reclamation formed to take the lead on what was then labeled the Shoshone Project. In 1910, the final version of the Shoshone Dam, now called the Buffalo Bill Dam, was completed and became the largest dam of its kind on earth. The Bighorn Basin flowed with irrigation henceforth, and Cody's ultimate dream of bringing water to the northern plateaus of Wyoming was finally realized. To this day, the basin sports crops such as corn, oats, barley, alfalfa, and sugar beets. More importantly, the basin and its neighboring regions were supplied with hydroelectric power, preserving the integrity of Wyoming's natural resources and fighting back against their exploitation by corporations. One might take a step back and assume Cody's business and social life mirrored a well-functioning personal life. Surely, with his exploits in revitalizing Wyoming and fortunes found in show business, his family back home was reveling with pride and admiration. Unfortunately for everyone, Cody's home life was anything but peachy. As Buffalo Bill's Wild West increased the frontiersman's celebrity status, the tensions with his wife heightened. There had been rumors of bad blood the minute after their vows were read and the wedding ceremony concluded, but much of which had been transpired by the words of Cody's own pen. The tensions didn't cease as gossip of infidelity surrounded the showman into the 1890s, with Frederici confronting Cody in an unannounced visit to Chicago. It was obvious women were enamored by Buffalo Bill and the grandeur his lifestyle suggested. It didn't seem promising for a man of his status to live out the quintessential American family cliches the frontier is known for, and the tension turned to tabloid material by the end of the 19th century. In 1904, Cody filed for divorce, despite it being quite controversial at the time. It was growing apparent to the frontiersman that his rocky relationship with his wife, siblings, and his own children could not be sustained, and risked the public humiliation a dissolution could bring. He attempted to ask for divorce quietly and behind the scenes, as most of his personal life was still relatively unknown to the audiences who filled his seats. 
Frederici wouldn't abide by the secrecy, however, and their ensuing court case became quite the fodder for newspapers both local and beyond the confines of the Old West. Cody was convinced his wife had attempted to poison him and accused her of sabotaging their guests at their North Platte home. Frederici denied such claims and in turn believed her husband was a serial womanizer with an affinity for infidelity. After she was sued in court and her financial gains put into jeopardy, the fight was on and the public was all too aware of the family's mess. In a tragic twist though, the divorce trials were put on pause. In late 1904, Cody and Frederici's younger daughter, Arta Louise, died as a result of organ failure. Her father and mother were both grief-stricken, and the loss inspired Cody to attempt to call off the dissolution. However, when Frederici went as far as to blame her daughter's death on her husband, the uproar continued. In 1905, when the courts reconvened and a verdict was reached, Cody's divorce was not granted as the judge ruled on behalf of Frederici. The public was quick to show support for the family matriarch, and Cody could only grumble about the court's ultimatum, that incompatibility was not grounds for divorce. According to the judge, the antics of Cody's own sisters had blown up his marriage to Frederici, not Frederici herself. The judge also believed Cody had been a philanderer whilst touring with his show, and as a result, felt no sympathy towards the frontiersmen. Cody eventually resigned to the ruling and sought to slowly reconvene with his wife. The couple remained distant as the Wild West shows finished its tours through Europe. However, their communication wasn't nearly as sparse or mean-spirited as it had been. In 1910, the two put the past behind them and spent most of their time together, even during Cody's travels. It was a miraculous fairy tale ending, considering what the pair had been through and symbolized the roller coaster nature of William Cody's life and literally everything he involved himself with. After reconciling with his family and seeing Buffalo Bill's Wild West come full circle, there wasn't much time left in Cody's journey. He continued traversing the United States and the world at large for frontier showcases and Wild West conventions whenever the appetite was there. The American frontier had changed drastically throughout the showman's life maybe more than any other figure who saturated their existence in the culture and history of the Old West. Cody knew it too, and was grateful for his role in developing the frontier by the time he reached his sunset. On January 10th, 1917, William Frederick Cody took his last breath, dying from complications of kidney failure. He had been baptized on January 9th by the Catholic Church in Denver, Colorado, and was surrounded by loved ones in the home of his sister. In the days and months following Cody's demise, an outpouring of grief, admiration, and condolences were received from around the globe. Whether it was President Woodrow Wilson at home, or Kaiser Wilhelm II and King George V from abroad, no one was shy in mourning the loss of a giant. After a full Masonic funeral was held, arrangements were made for Cody's burial. Many folks wished for him to be laid to rest in the town he founded in Northwest Wyoming, but the frontiersmen had already put in a special request. Cody wanted to be buried on Lookout Mountain in Golden, Colorado, a piece of land at the front of the Rocky Mountains that provided an unparalleled view of the Great Plains. It was a poetic gravesite for a man such as Buffalo Bill Cody, and his family honored his dying wish. After the route to Lookout Mountain was thawed later that spring, Cody's body was transported and buried at its peak on June 3, 1917. Legend goes, his body was swapped out for an anonymous double and instead was buried on Cedar Mountain in Cody, Wyoming, but these claims are unfounded and purely speculation as part of the greater Buffalo Bill lore. The same week as his burial, the rights to Buffalo Bill's Wild West show were pawned off to the highest bidder officially sold on June 9th to Archer Banker. It was worth just $105,000 by that point, an equivalent to just $2.4 million when adjusted for inflation. Despite this, however, monetary value of a dying stage production would not define William Cody's lasting legacy, 
but his impact on social and cultural issues in the back half of the 19th century would. As a showman, Cody came around to civil rights for Native Americans, admitting those who were once his foes had become his friends. At one point, Cody stated, Every Indian outbreak that I have ever known has resulted from broken promises and broken treaties by the government. He went out of his way to provide opportunities to Native performers and their respective families since the heyday of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. He granted them livable wages and often expressed his desire to showcase the humanity of indigenous life and not just the stagecoach raids and hostile attacks seen in his lauded productions. Cody was also a staunch supporter of women's suffrage. He believed hardworking women deserved pay equal to their male counterparts and gave featured roles to the leading female performers in a show, such as Annie Oakley and Calamity Jane. Above all though, Cody understood the impact he and his fellow buffalo hunters had on the gradual decimation of the natural bison population on the Great Plains. Later in life, he became an outspoken critic of hide hunting, and he eventually became a full-on conservationist. When it's all said and done, the history of the Old West and the stories of the American frontier absolutely cannot be told without uttering the name of William Cody. Neither can the narrative of his exploits be ignored considering the impact Buffalo Bill's Wild West has had on American popular culture for the last 150 years. Without William Cody, there are no Westerns, or at least the iterations we remember them by. Hollywood would be a completely different medium, and the way we remember history would come through a drastically changed lens of which it's viewed through. The mythology of the West would be phased and fractured, and ultimately, the footprints of the frontier would be lost to the dust and debris of westward migration. William Cody made us care about the frontier. He lived a life emblematic of the American dream, hard work, exploration, and the innate ability to fill joy in the hearts of many who cross paths. Buffalo Bill will forever remain America's greatest showman. His legend will carry on for eternity, both the good and the bad. The story of the United States cannot be told without him, and such an honor only exists for a few. So while fact might sometimes blur with fiction, next time you throw on your favorite western, or crack open your favorite folktale, or pay tribute to your favorite slice of frontier history, remember William Frederick Cody. Remember the real Buffalo Bill. Remember the father of the American frontier.